Hey Prodigal, we are so glad you joined us today. Whether that's right here at Bullard or online, we see you and we're so glad you're here. Hey, last week we started our brand new sermon series called Summer of Love. And we are just taking a one week break today as we welcome a guest speaker. And Pastor John will be back next week to continue our Summer of Love series right where he left off in 1 John. Going along with our Summer of Love series, last week we started Water for Wells. This is a great opportunity for our church to come together to purchase wells for clean drinking water for those in need. So last week I hear we ran out of water bottles. Good news, we've got some more this week. So you can, on your way out of service, grab one. They look just like this. Or if you're not able to join us in service today, you can use whatever you have at home. So find an empty two liter, a Gatorade bottle, Fill it up with your extra change. We're so excited to see how many wells we can purchase as a church. One week from tomorrow, we start VBS, and we are so excited. It's July 11th through the 15th, right here at Bullard from nine to noon. If you haven't signed up, it is not too late. So head over to our app or our website to sign your kids up today. Our theme this year is Make Waves. So all week long, your kids are gonna be learning about how what they do today can change the world around them. It's gonna be an amazing week. We can't wait to hang out with your kids. Also, if you haven't signed up to volunteer and you want to, you can also do that on the app or the website. We're so excited for VBS this summer. To stay up to date on all things Prodigal, make sure you check out our app, our website, social media. It's all there. We don't want you guys to miss a thing this summer. We are so thankful for your continued support and generosity. If you would like to give to Prodigal, there's a couple ways you can do so. You can head over to the app we keep talking about, also our website, just click the Give tab. We also have giving boxes and giving kiosks in the lobby if you'd like to donate there. Thanks again for your generosity. And that's all I've got for announcements today. We are so glad you joined us. Have a great Sunday. I don't want to be known for what I hate. I don't want to miss the things that make your heart break I don't want to say things you'd never say Come have your way in me Let justice roll like a river in my soul let mercy overflow like a flood Let kindness burn like a fire in my bones The light's the way back home for all to come I want to be known by love Known by love I want to be known by love Known by love So come and help me see The way you see and Come and show me how to be Your hands and feet Oh, I want to be the friend That you would be So come have your Let justice roll like a river in my soul Let mercy overflow like a flood Let kindness burn like a fire in my bones The light's the way back home for all to come
soul Let mercy overflow Like a flood Let kindness burn Like a fire in my bones That lights the way back home Back to you Cause I want to be known by love No Hey church, I want to highlight a few things just before we dive in. Next week is our kids summer camp, our VBS, and we can't wait. Your kids are going to learn, laugh, sing, love, play games, um, all to help us live in love like Jesus in a greater way. Uh, we have lots of people signed up for me who don't attend Prodigal Church, and so this is a great chance for us to be a blessing to the community. We want to encourage you to invite friends or family that have children ages 5 to 12. Uh, we're going to have an absolute blast. And also, if you yourself are available to volunteer and serve, what a great opportunity to uh, work alongside each other to help these kids have the greatest week of their summer. And now on to the message. Uh, my family and I are on vacation this week, and we've invited Micah Foster to come and share with our community this morning. Micah has been a pastor in our state for over 15 years. Uh, he's a great dad. He's a great dude. And he comes from within our church community here at Prodigal, and we can't wait to hear what he has to say. And so would you give a warm Prodigal Church welcome to Micah Foster? Well, thank you for that intro, John. That's really generous. Like John said, my name is Micah, and on a normal or typical Sunday morning, you can find me in PC Kids sitting with my daughter or in the back of the room running sound. And I love our church and mission. That's why I love serving behind the scenes. But today I'd like to take us on a bit of a side journey out of the book of 1 John and into some verses, very small verses of the letter or epistle of James, the brother of Jesus. Some people don't ever think about this, but Jesus had brothers and sisters, and James was the next oldest boy, a half-brother of Jesus. So if you think about it, the Blessed Virgin Mary stayed blessed or blessed, but did not remain a virgin. Now, how many of you have a brother out there, specifically a younger brother? You know how annoying they can be, how difficult they can be. Now, what would it take for you to convince your younger brother that you are the Son of God, the promised Messiah, the fulfillment of the law and the Savior of the world. Well, I think some of you are like, I've, I've tried that and it didn't take, it didn't stick. You know, there, there were a lot of things I tried to do to convince my brother that I was amazing. And guess what? It just continued to bug me. I'm pretty sure you'd have to predict your own death and resurrection and then pull it off. And that's exactly what Jesus did. And the funny thing is, the interesting thing is, James wasn't even a follower of Jesus until after his resurrection. So it was a pretty risky decision to include a letter from James, the little brother of Jesus, in the New Testament. But there it is, sandwiched between Hebrews and 1 Peter. Now, since I'm a little brother myself, I could imagine the temptation to say all kinds of crazy things about his older brother. But he didn't. He only said the truth. The major theme of his letter, I'll give it to you right here, right away. Faith without action, faith without deeds, is dead. He says it like this. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. James 1, 22. Let me give a quick point of clarification here. Although James says the word, which many of us in our Christian thought would, mean, would think to mean the entire Bible, what he's actually meaning is logos. Now, in John 1.14, we see that Jesus is introduced as logos. That's actually one of the words used to describe him. It's a name of Jesus. The word in the New Testament is one of the names of Jesus. So when I read James saying, do not merely listen to the word, I hear him saying, do not merely listen to my brother, 
but do what he says. So James is not saying do all of the commands of the Old Testament, all of the old law, do all of the old covenant. He's saying listen to the new covenant. James, my brother, listen to him, but don't merely listen. Do what he says. Let me sum that up real easily for you. It's like he's saying, don't just listen to what my brother says, but do what he said. Being a doer of what Jesus says is a risky decision, especially if you are one of those people who are risk averse, meaning you avoid risk at all costs, and you're constantly asking yourself, what if? But let me give you a different what if. What if the biggest risk in this life is taking no risk at all? In fact, the idea that I'd like to introduce to you today is what if genuine faith necessitates risk? I'll say it like this. If you never risk anything for the sake of your faith, I'm not sure you can call it faith because faith without action is useless. Or as we've already established and James has told us, it's dead. Now let me pull back the veil a little bit and give you an insight into pastoring. Give you an insight into church work because I was a pastor for most of my adult life. In fact, up until the end of last summer, I was a pastor of a local church. So I have a little insight into this. Here are some of the riskiest things that you can do as a pastor, but they're necessary if you want to have a healthy church. But they just feel really, really risky. For instance, holding people with open hands, like deciding that nobody is my people, that you are God's people. Nobody is prodigal's people. You are God's people. Uh, you may leave. You may come. You may go. You may participate. You may not participate. But just being here to serve the people, that's pretty risky, just holding people with open hands. How about this one? Baptizing people who have really messy lives. Maybe that's you. We just want you to know you're welcome. Like th This can be the church for you. Or inviting people to serve or get it connected in some way that are brand new and maybe they don't have all their theology together. Well, welcome to the club. We're all a work in progress. Or this one, inviting people into small group environments to publicly kind of profess or publicly share their objections, their fears, their, their doubts, and they'll be welcomed and okay. That seems pretty risky. Here's another one not answering everybody's question uh, so that they are fully satisfied with your answer. That's hard to do as a pastor. Here's one of the riskiest ones in Fresno, California. Never publicly taking a political stand or standing firm on the idea that the church is a people you know, not a place that you go. Perhaps this is the riskiest of all, and this is probably the biggest temptation of all when you're in church work. Refusing to use guilt and shame as motivators. In my pastoring years, these have been uh, countercultural ideals and beliefs that I have held so dearly, and so does Prodigal. And that's one of the big reasons why we chose to close down our church and join this one and be a part of this one and support this one because prodigal was already the church that we were aspiring to be. The bottom line is it's risky being a church that irreligious and non-church people could come be themselves and find the love of Jesus. It's actually pretty risky, but our mission is too important to abandon just because it's risky. After all, our mission necessitates risk. And may I remind you that our mission is to love God and love people. Love necessitates risk. Before Erica and I got married, we talked about the possibility of adopting a child. And then in 2009, we had our son Josiah. Then we had our daughter in 2012, Bryn. So we were good. We had our two kids, a dog and a house. And we sort of put off the idea of adoption into a category of that would be something we could do, but I know things are pretty good right now and I don't really want to risk that dynamic. We were living the American dream. One boy, one girl, perfect, we're done, well done, good job. But there was still this little something in the back of our hearts. Uh, and deep down we knew we weren't truly done forming our family. James, again, the brother of Jesus wrote this in James 1.27. 
He says this, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. And we knew that. And I've always felt an affinity to that verse for some reason, but to physically adopt seemed a little much at that time. If you keep reading that verse, there's another part of that verse that I think is very important. James also adds this, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Now, for most of my life when I read that, I thought pollution equaled sin. That it was just the bad stuff, you know, the bad stuff you do and the things you're tempted to do. It's actually more than that. I think the pollution of the world, I believe, is self-centeredness. So Eric and I were feeling good about life. We were happy with our kid count. And then out of the blue, all of a sudden, we got a call from a friend of ours. Actually, it was a friend of a friend. And they were looking for someone to enter into an adoption agreement for somebody who was pregnant. And we were faced with this big life-changing decision. First of all, should we adopt? Second of all, is this the right decision? So we prayed and 15 minutes later, we found ourselves in a local adoption agency office and we just showed up and said, here's our situation. We don't know what to do. Can you help us? And thankfully they had the time and they had the energy to help us think through that situation. Now, ultimately we decided that was not the right situation for us, but but it was something God used to push us a little bit and get us to open our hearts to risk. Sometimes our hearts are hard because we've built a hedge of protection around them to avoid the risk of pain. And sometimes God breaks our hearts by giving us the awareness of a need which motivates us to action. And that's what happened. Our hearts broke and our hearts broke especially for adoption through fostering. So we decided to start down that road. Five years ago today, today, a foster child was placed in our home and just nine months later, we finalized Eli's adoption. Foster adoption is full of risk. In fact, the kind we did was actually called risk adopt because we were told that the likelihood that Eli would stay in our home was only about 5% from the beginning. And we were reluctantly open to the idea that we would be his temporary family. But if we hadn't taken the risk, who knows where Eli would be? Risk was necessary for Eli and for the rest of our family. Every night, as we put our kids to bed, we pray and we tell our kids secrets. We've done this since their birth. We've done this since the beginning. We started with Josiah and we've kept going. And one of the lines that we've told them, one of the secrets that we've always told them is take care of the widows and the orphans and those who can't take care of themselves. And it was time for us to put our money where our mouth was. So every night Josiah was born, I've been reminding myself inadvertently that God put in our hearts to adopt. And now that phrase, take care of the orphans, has a real face and a real name. And he's part of our family. And it's been my absolute privilege to do my best to introduce Eli to Jesus. And I cannot tell you how amazing it is to be entrusted with that honor. In fact, this past Easter, at Prodigal, many of you witnessed his baptism. Here's a clip. Hi, my name is Eli Foster, and today I'm getting baptized. I learned about Jesus by going to church and from my family. I want to get baptized to show the whole world that I want to follow Jesus. I pray to follow Jesus a couple months ago at FCA. Hi, my name is Eli Foster and I am Christ for Life. I met Eli around uh, his third birthday. It's obvious, I think, I think you figured it out. We adopted him. And what's amazing to me about that is I have been able to understand what our Father feels when we are adopted into the heavenly family, when we are a part of the royal family of God. And so I'm so happy today to baptize Eli because this is real, but it's gonna be even more real. He's your father. He's just letting me father you for now. 
I'll always be your father here, but he's your father forever, okay? I want to ask you a simple question. Do you love Jesus? Yes. Do you want to follow him for the rest of your life and into eternity? Yes. On that confession, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I got your nose. You get my arm, okay? Let's go. this. You don't have to adopt a child to follow Jesus. That may not be the risk he calls you to, but make no mistake, living for Jesus in this life is a risky decision. Faith in Jesus isn't about having an easy life. It's about having a life worth living, a life that is lived for the benefit of others. I'm not encouraging you to take unnecessary risk. I'm encouraging you to understand that risk is absolutely necessary for your faith. So, what holds you back from truly living out your faith? Underneath it all is probably fear. If we let fear stand in the way of our risk-taking faith, we run the risk of worshiping the gods of security and self. But if you want a life that is worth living, risk your security for the sake of someone else. Back to our mission. Love God. Love people. Love is risky. But... We authenticate our faith. We authenticate our love for God by loving others. So let's be authentic. So here are three and simple small ways you can move yourself into action based on what we've talked about today. <laughs> These are gonna feel really small, but it's okay. The first one is water for wells. You can help provide clean drinking water to people who would not otherwise have it. Don't you feel like that's a fundamental right of humanity? Well, if so, you can give to that. You can go to our app, you can pull down the drop-down menu for different ways to give, and you can give to Water for Wells. Also, you can go to the app and you can sign up your kids, your grandkids, your nephews, your nieces for VBS, and that may feel like a risk. What if they don't like it? That's a risk. But what if they do? And what if they meet Jesus for the first time? Or you could volunteer. You can Go on the app and you can say, I want to volunteer for VBS. And the risk is, what if the kids ask me something I don't know the answer to? Well, they probably will, but that's okay. You don't have to be the Bible answer man. Now, these are three simple ways to apply what we've learned today, but in no way, shape, or form am I suggesting that this is a checklist, that if you do these three things, that you've fulfilled this thing, you can move on with your life. What I'm saying is this is a way of life. Loving others, loving God is a way of life. Loving others as if you were loving God through that action is a way of life. And you have the opportunity to do that in your home, in your office, in your school, in your clubs, wherever you find yourself interacting with people is an opportunity to show God's love to someone else and authenticate your love for God. So I encourage you to take this principle that loving people authenticates your love for God and apply it to your everyday life. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity for me to share a little bit of what's on my heart, a little bit about our family story. I pray that what I've said today impacts the people's lives who watch or listen to this message, that they would take action, that they would do those three things or one of those three things, but also that they would just live this in their life, that this would be, be a part of who they are, that you would live through them, that they would not focus on self and security, but they would risk it all for the sake of someone else, just as you did for us. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen.